Hello guys, first of all, I would like to apologize because I couldn't post a video in the past 9 to 10 days because mainly I was out of town and later when I turned in Berlin, I was really sick and ill and I couldn't really uh, record a video, although I have prepared a script for this. And it is about the grand chessboard of Bijensky and its correlation to the Ukraine war. I know some of you would say, Kerok, are you again talking about the grand chessboard? I would say, wait. What I'm trying to do is to raise the bar of the discussion in my channel because I want you and me to have a better understanding of international politics. Nowadays, if you open uh, or turn on your TV, you will see very simplified arguments and statements, cartoonish, yeah, I would say, right? But it, for me, it's very important to have a quality audience and not only numbers. Numbers are important, of course, for any um, content creator, but also to have a quality audience like you, it's very important for me. So first things first, in order uh, to be complete transparent, the text or the script of this uh, episode is taken from a Twitter thread by a person called Arnaud Bertrand. I have posted the link of this person in the description below and also the link for the thread in the description below. So all the credits for the information or uh, the summary of the book goes to Arnold Bertrand. What I am trying to do is I have read the thread, I have learned from it, so I'm trying to bring to you as well in a more visual way so for us to have, as I mentioned, a better understanding for the Ukraine war. So Arnold Bertrand, he posted a very interesting thread on Twitter about Bijensky's book, The Grand Chessboard, and he found parallels in today's context in Ukraine. I'm posting this video because I would like to enrich the content of my channel on Syrian analysis and bring the discussion to a higher intellectual level. So we can discuss this in the comments below. Wyszynski, as you may know, he was the national security advisor for Jimmy Carter, and he is largely known or considered one of the most prominent U.S. policy strategists over the past few decades. There is no discussion about that. One of Wyszynski, Wyszynski's big arguments, which has proven to be true in my opinion nowadays, was that in order to retain what it called its global hegemony, the U.S. has to retain primacy in. Eurasia. To elaborate his argument, Bijensky divides Eurasia into four spaces, middle space, which is Russia today, west, south, and east. Bijensky writes that for America to prevail, there are three preconditions or conditions. First condition, the middle space should be drawn increasingly into the expanding orbit of the west, where America predominates. Second condition, the southern region should not be subjected to domination by a single player. In other words, the Middle East and Central Asia should be divided and or not ruled over by any other player than the United States. The third condition and the last condition is the East should not be unified in a manner that prompts the expulsion of America from its offshore bases. In other words, Eastern Asia should be divided as well as so that the US military gets to keep the obvious in this map. Now, what do we conclude from this? First conclusion, it isn't in America's strategic interest for countries in Eurasia to be in good terms with each other. More than anything, America's objective is the divide and conquer strategy, especially in the Middle East and Asia. Interestingly, Brzezinski writes that if the middle space rebuffs the West, becomes an assertive single entity and either gains control over the South or forms an alliance with the major Eastern actor, here I think he is referring to China, which is unquestionably the major Eastern actor, then America's primacy in Eurasia shrinks dramatically. In other words, if Russia pulls away from the West and gains control of the Middle East and Central Asia or forms alliance with China, which is unquestionably today's major let's say, Eastern actor, then American global hegemony is seriously compromised. Bijensky goes further to warn that the most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran. This gives a whole new understanding for us uh, for the current uh, negotiations between Iran and the Western powers in regards to the nuclear program of Iran. It seems that especially the United States under the Democrats and uh, President Biden, they would like to neutralize Iran from the Chinese and the from any sort of alliance with China and uh, Russia. Therefore, they are trying to revive the nuclear deal which was killed under President Trump. Because as you may know, the three pillars of the Eurasian bloc is China, Russia 
and Iran. And when you neutralize Iran, you will really diminish the power of Eurasia. And even if China and Russia have, uh, let's say, increasing power in the Eurasian region, without Iran, they wouldn't have the first territorial uh, reach and also the, um, the way that they can expand their influence in the Middle East through Iran. Wyjenski gives two scenarios that would sign the end of America's global hegemony. The first scenario is if the two major Eastern players were somehow to unite. What are these two major powers, one may ask? Unquestionably, China and the second one uh, is perhaps still Japan, although um, in my opinion also India is a very major and serious contender nowadays. The second condition, as Bijensky mentions, is the ejection of America by its Western partners from its perch on the Western periphery. He says that would automatically spell the end of US hegemony. This is probably why the United States nowadays is so much investing in um, keeping the European continent, and especially the European Union countries, under its umbrella, especially after the eruption of the war in Ukraine. And not only that, the United States is trying to turn the EU countries into a vassal states for, for them. Now, if we go a decade or two back, we will see or we remember, for example, the era of Jacques Chirac and even under Angela Merkel. Of course, they were uh, aligned with NATO and the United States. However, they also pursued their own national interests when it came to the geopolitical conflict, such as in Ukraine. But increasingly, the European Union leaders are becoming um, undistinguishable, let's say, from the American politicians and officials. And nowadays you don't see any difference between the statements of uh, Biden administration and most of the leaders in uh, the European Union. And recently, the foreign minister of Germany, Baerbock, who is uh, the first female foreign minister, and ironically, she wanted to pursue a feminist foreign policy. She is the one who is calling for increasing increased weapon supply for um, the Zelensky, let's say, government. Uh, I mean, the Zelensky government, of course, he has a Ukrainian army, but among the Ukrainian army, there are also um, paramilitary groups who they identify themselves as uh, Nazi groups. And so this weaponry will end up in the hands of the Nazis. This is very ironic, but yeah, this is something worth to mention. Interestingly, in this context, Wyjenski also mentions Ukraine, which to him plays the role of critically important geopolitical pivot because the very existence of what he calls a new space denies Russia the possibility to be a Eurasian empire. Now, Wyjenski calls the loss of Ukraine after more than 300 years of Russian imperial history a vital geopolitical setback for the Russian state because this condemns Russia to become less European and more Asiatic with each passing year. Brzezinski unsurprisingly here sees that as a good thing, writing that redefining Ukraine as a central European state and ensuring its closer integration with Central Europe is a critically important component of the US's broader strategy for Eurasia. Brzezinski goes as far as saying that Ukraine is one of the three states that should receive America's strongest geopolitical support, and that Ukraine is the critical state insofar as Russia's own future evolution is concerned. Now, Brzezinski, however, recognizes that this US policy towards Ukraine is massively provocative towards Russia, writing that it was viewed by many in Moscow, even by its westernizers, as a policy directed at the vital Russian interest in eventually bringing Ukraine back into the common fold. Brzezinski also writes that the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, which he judges, will find it incomparably harder to acquiesce in because it would be to acknowledge that Ukraine's destiny is no longer organically linked to Russia's. Wyjenski nonetheless still finds it desirable because Russia cannot be Europe without Ukraine also being in Europe, whereas Ukraine can be in Europe without Russia being in Europe. Now to sum up, it looks like the calculation was that it is imperative to divide Ukraine or separate it uh, from Russia because doing so seriously weakens Russia's prospect to re-become or become a serious power in Eurasia again. Wyjenski seems to recognize that this would either create an unbridgeable divide with Russia or force its hand to become fully part of 
Europe together with Ukraine, he seems to find both consequences acceptable since Russia would be weak anyway. Now, what we have learned from this as a conclusion, I would like to mention this uh, point which is very important. I think that Bijensky warned of an alliance or a grand alliance between China, Russia and perhaps Iran. But the policy of the United States nowadays uh, towards Ukraine and Eastern European countries in general and the tensions with Russia and China is actually bringing China, Russia and Iran closer to each other. So despite the warning of Vygensky uh, that they shouldn't allow this uh, grand alliance, however, the current foreign policy of the United States is perhaps forcing or bringing these forces closer and closer together and what we can see nowadays china is really um, is holding the hand of russia in ukraine and russia now is in serious need for chinese markets and is becoming increasingly dependent also on the on the chinese market so one of the biggest winners of this ukrainian conflict in my opinion would be china and although iran uh, the Western powers are trying to attract Iran once again into to sign on a nuclear deal. But the Iranian hesitancy is also, if you read the articles and the statements coming from Iran or the arguments by Iranian geopolitical experts, they're asking themselves two questions. One, is it worth like signing on a deal with the United States right now when the paradigms or the balance of power is shifting from the West to the East? This is how they see it. And the second question is, let's suppose we signed the deal again. What, what are the guarantees? Where is the guarantee that the United States will abide with this agreement? Because when Trump came to power, he just canceled it with just one signature. And we all know at the current moment, Biden is having a really low uh, popularity in the United States. His approval rates are very low. And there is a high possibility that Trump would be uh, would possibly participate again in in the elections, and he could win. And if he wins, then uh, is he going to cancel it again? So is, this is not a game like you can sign it and then cancel it. So I think Iran is waiting for the elections in the United States to see if they are again the Democrats and they still want to continue in this deal and what are the conditions of this deal and if the uh, the other side or the conservatives come to power are they going to cancel it what's their uh, perspective about it so i think the next two years are very decisive to see uh, how the nuclear deal with iran will proceed and till then i don't think the conflict in ukraine will be over this is this seems to be going to be a long war unfortunately in Ukraine, especially with this influx of weapons into Ukraine. But these uh, will answer to these uh, questions. But how, what do you think about this? Do you think that Vygensky, uh, what he presented at least like two decades ago, is still applicable today? Or his ideas are no more applicable in nowadays conflicts, whether it's in Central Asia, whether it's in Ukraine or in Syria, or maybe we can take some of the ideas or the arguments of Vygensky and we can build upon it um, for new geopolitical ideas. Let me know your opinion in the comments below. I've been your host, Kirk Almasian of Syrian Analysis. If you're new, please consider subscribing. It really helps me. And also click the like button. It's really important for, for me to have a better uh, position in the algorithm of YouTube. And also, if you like to support an independent commentary work like this, you can become a patron. It's very easy. Link in the description below. And see you next time.